Hello people, I'm the Rokongba Gamer. Today is the fateful day. I am reviewing Jawbreakers. Been waiting forever for this book. Feels like forever ago when I got kicked out of the comic shop for supporting Jawbreakers, but it wasn't so it was like less than a year ago, I think. I don't remember the exact date, but yeah. Anyways, the book's finally here. We've been waiting a long time for it. It caused a lot of hubbub. A lot of people were very pissed about this book. A lot of people were very happy about this book. So I am here to review it, and I'm going to be reviewing it as if it's a normal Marvel or DC book. I'm not going to be giving it any special thing either way. It's not going to be treated any differently. The only way I'm treating it differently is talking about like the quality of the book itself in terms of, like the pages and things like that because it is an Indiegogo book. So that's the only thing I'm going to be talking about that's different. So let's talk about that aspect first. So quality of the book feels just like an image book. If you've picked up an image trade, it feels just like it's really good quality. So A plus on that, it feels really good and the pages are good and it doesn't feel cheap or anything like that. It does not feel cheaply made. It definitely feels good. It's a pretty decent size. And uh, I gotta say the, the logo design is really cool too. The logo is dope. I really like the Jawbreakers logo. So A plus on that aspect of it. Book doesn't get an A plus for much else though. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> um, <laughs> This, this book was honestly not too disappointing because I wasn't expecting a whole lot, but it's not that good. There is some great stuff about this book, though. The I'd say the best thing about the book is the colors by Brett Smith. The colors by Brett Smith are just fantastic, really good, great, standout job. Uh, he, especially when you um compare it to some of the other Indiegogos, if you look at them, which don't necessarily have bad colors, but they, there's a clear difference between, uh, like, an industry pro, like, Brett Smith, and then someone else who's on, like, some other Indiegogos, he, he really elevates the book and just makes things pop, and just, great job. John Malin's art is pretty good, I've always described him as, like, the, like, Liefeld 2.0, because I, I'm not the biggest fan of Liefeld, like, some of his art's good, some of it's not very good at all, he's very rough, very up and down for me, and I feel like Malin's a lot more consistent, a lot more sleek with, like, how his characters look. My only problem with Malin is sometimes the faces look a little weird, and, like, soulless, and not in a good way. Sometimes the faces are off, especially with, um, Zaxi in this, I think that's how you say her name, whatever, the, um, the chick that, like, everyone was complaining about because she was, like, scantily clad in the first preview images of Jawbreakers. Her face sometimes just doesn't look right. Sometimes with the other characters too, but her face I've noticed was the one that was changing the most from like panel to panel. But besides that, art's pretty good. Writing on the other hand, we're going to get into is is really rough. But uh spoiler alert, if you have not read the book and you're about to read it or like you just got it and you just haven't had time to sit down and read it, I will be spoiling the book. I'm only going to be talking about the first story arc, though, because there's like three different story arcs in here. The reason I'm only talking about the first one is because that's what this Indiegogo was like sold on. That's what it was advertised as was like this was the first story arc. The other two is kind of like padding. So you feel like you got your money's worth instead of paying like uh, $25 for just like this tiny little story arc. This way you get the other two with it, which I'm happy through the other two in, but I'm not going to be talking about that was at all. I'm talking about what the Indiegogo was sold on which is the story with uh you know by richard meyer uh john malin and brett smith those guys well i mean richard meyer did the story but the other two you know did art and colors anyways that's what i'm going to be talking about so spoilers if you haven't read it anyways let's get into it the book opens with the jawbreakers in france they just saved the city but apparently the people there didn't like how they saved the city so the authorities are chasing them they run they get away and then they meet up with whom i'm assuming is their handler which is a guy named kill switch he just is like hey guys i got a new job for you and he tells him nigeria there's a new place so next page we're in nigeria they're getting briefed on it by this chick named zaxi and she just we missed the briefing is <laughs> because she shows up and she's like, I got a job for you. Only one condition. I have to go with you guys when you go do the job. We're like, okay. Then we cut and they're like, oh, well, that's a hard story to, to believe. And it's like, what's the story? What's she telling them? We, we don't know. We just completely missed it. Because apparently uh, Meyer thought it wasn't an important detail to tell us why the jawbreakers are going to Nigeria. He just cuts over it like just cuts that part out so yeah we're kind of clueless as to why we're going there i mean 
we know somewhat from the cover, but we don't know all the details. All we know is giant gorilla, but we don't really know and the book doesn't tell you. Cut to the team in Nigeria driving through the wilderness. And yes, I've said cut to a couple times because that's exactly what this book does. It moves at breakneck speeds. Like there's no transition or anything or setup for really anything. It's just, they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here. And it just go, goes, go, go, goes. It never has a part where it slows down or tries to really transition you to anywhere. It's just like, you're with these characters. Now you're with these characters. Now you're with these characters. Now you're with these characters and they're doing this and they're here and they're at this part of the world now they're at this part of the world and it's like it's it's definitely very messy and there's not really any smooth transitions but anyways that's why i've been saying a lot like cut to this cut to that because that's exactly what the book does it cuts to a lot of different areas anyways uh they're in nigeria now they're driving through the wilderness then oh my god a giant gorilla shows up and they're all like freaked out like oh man it's a gorilla the weird part about this is this is the first time we actually see the gorilla and I mean not first time I've seen it. it is the first time I've seen gorilla but I mean this is the first time the gorilla is actually mentioned up until this point Meyer kind of kept the gorilla a secret for whatever reason even though he's right there on the cover and also in the Indiegogo he was on like some of the first few um, preview pages we got but in the book we missed the briefing, so we never hear anything about the uh, ape. Zaxi never says anything about the ape. They're driving, we never hear anything about the ape. Then he just shows up, and it's like, what? It just was weird. It kind of, like, confused me as to why the ape was never mentioned. Like, why it was kind of kept as, like, a secret to the reader, even though... Like, what? It, does, it didn't make sense to me. It just felt kind of odd and I didn't get why Meyer did that but anyways the team was driving in the wilderness then the gorilla shows up turns out they're driving on the gorilla so now they're like up in the air like a billion stories in the air on top of this giant gorilla they're all falling freaking out Zaxi calls to uh cuffs and is like how or she's like cuffs as she's falling why she called the cuffs and not just help in general I have no clue these two have known each other for like five minutes the only, like, they have no history together. The only prior thing we saw with them was Cuffs offered her some body armor prior to going into battle. I'm, well, going on the mission. So I'm not sure why she called him, but apparently they used to have a deep connection. We see more of that later in the book where it's kind of like there's no progression at all. There's no character progression or relationship progression with those two. It's just they meet, they're in love, and that's it. It's, it's kind of weird. But anyways, we see everyone's falling. Except for Cuffs, he's like holding on to the gorilla and Silkworm creates a hang glider out of thin air. So this, at this part, I'm gathering that uh, Cuffs, I'm not Cuffs, Silkworm's power is he can make constructs. I don't know how any of that works or anything because the book never tells us. Which granted, you know, not every single comic needs to explain every single thing that happens. But this is the first time a lot of people are being introduced to the Jawbreakers, myself included. I know these are characters that uh, Meyer has like written about before and has had in his head for a long time. But you gotta realize this is the first time a lot of people are gonna be coming in here. I know none of your other Kickstarters or anything made even close to Jawbreakers. I mean, prior to Jawbreakers made even close. So you have to realize there's so many more people that are coming into this. So you need to explain some things. Instead, Meyer kind of just assumes everyone knows as much about Jawbreakers as he does. So when some stuff happens, it's kind of like, okay, so that's that guy's power, I guess? Or does he have other power? It's a little confusing. Like, considering this book is very tongue in cheek and uh, has an 80s vibe, they could have done some type of, like, intro, for, like, an intro page for each character, be like, hey, I'm Cuffs, my power is, like, super strength or whatever, I'm not sure what his power is, like, I'm Silkworm, and my power is I cre create constructs with my mind, like, they could have done that, and no one would have been like, ah, that's stupid, because the book doesn't take itself too seriously, and that would have helped a lot with the characters, first off with their names, because I didn't know any of their names, and also helping with their power so we know what they can do and things like that. Instead, we don't really know anything. But anyways, after Silkworm flies around for a bit, we see that everyone is safe on the ground except for Cuffs. He's still up there on the gorilla's shoulder, and I'll read exactly what happens next for you guys. Cuffs says, Hold up, I'm about to rock this fool with the power of 1,000 slaves! And then he punches his eyeball out. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean with the power of 1,000. What? Why is it? Because he's black and he's strong? I don't. So he has the power of slay. What is? I'm confused. I don't. I don't get what this means. What Meyer was going for. All I got from this panel was utter confusion and that Cuffs has super strength, which I didn't know prior to this. So I guess his power is super strength. 
but it's just, it's just so weird, and it, I I don't understand it. I get again that the book's very tongue in cheek, doesn't take itself too seriously, but that just this just just doesn't make any sense. So I don't whatever. Anyways, the rest of the Jawbreakers team yells at Cuffs over their like inner com whatever their 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 comms, and they tell him, "Oh, stop saying that, Cuffs," because apparently he always says the power of one thousand slaves. They're like, "You do." You don't know where your powers come from, you big idiot. Don't say that. And uh, so apparently no one knows where Cuff's powers come from or what's going on. Uh, but yeah, we next we get a little gag to where Hellpriest is on the ground. And that giant eyeball from the ape that Cuff's just uh, just knocked out of, his, of the gorilla's face is coming down. And boom, it swallows up Hellpriest. He's stuck inside the eyeball. You see... The funny part about him getting stuck inside the eyeball is they're like, how priest, an eyeball's coming. And he's like, what? I don't see it. And then gets hit by the eyeball and gets stuck in there. See, what's funny about that is because he can't see the eyeball and we use eyeballs to see. That's how humans work. And it's funny because it's kind of ironic. While all that went down, Knife Hand, who is a character that is very self-explanatory, so I'm happy about that. I understand that his powers is he has sharp energy hands. Very self-explanatory. Good job there. And he's basically, he's basically like Snake Eyes, but with superpowers is what I'm gathering, because he can't talk and he seems very sort of ninja-like. Anyways, Knife Hand comes in and he like slices the, uh, the Achilles heel of this giant ape. And that causes him to stumble a little bit. And then Silkworm gets Cannonball specialed by uh, Cuffs into the gorilla's mouth. And then goes out the back of his mouth. And um, all this apparently turns on Zaxi. And so Zaxi and Cuffs get really horny. And they start like making out with each other. And we get, But prior to them making out, we get some, some fantastic dialogue from your boy. <laughs> I'll read from the book again. It says, it's over, girl. You're safe. I'm only safe when I'm with you. And then they start making out. Just, this book is so good. Then we see the team down on the ground. And uh, Knife Hand is about to deliver the killing blow to this gorilla by just cutting his heart out. So he cuts his heart out. And then all this uh, treasure spills out. Like gold and treasure chests and stuff. And they're like, oh, wow, that's cool. And then a witch doctor shows up out of nowhere. And he, like, gives us the backstory on the ape. The, the witch doctor says, and I quote, This great beast was once a simple lowland gorilla. He wandered into a vortex and was transported, transformed. His soul ripped from his body, lost forever. I, pff, no clue what the hell that means, but apparently this gorilla walked through a portal and it turned big, or he was already big before he went through the portal, but he's from a different world. But his soul got separated from his body i don't i didn't know gorillas had souls i don't i don't know it's it's a soulless gorilla that's now big and the witch doctor likes him i don't whatever then the witch doctor performs some type of voodoo magic ritual like just in front of all the jawbreakers and no one tries to stop him or do anything but he does that and that causes the gorilla to sort of heal up a bit he's just wounded now he's not completely dead it like sews up some of his wounds but it makes the witch doctor like he's all dried out and now he can't even move and he's like on the brink of death now because he i guess he like gave some of his being to the gorilla or whatever then silkworm is just like oh man why'd you do that and then he's like oh these people are coming um, we might die. I'm not going to die for your God. And then the witch doctor says, he's not my God. But the witch doctor says it's his duty to protect the gorilla because of what the gorilla represents to humanity. Again, no clue what the hell that means, what the gorilla means to humanity. I have no clue, but that's what the witch doctor says. Then the witch doctor reaches into the pool of blood from the gorilla from when they like tried to cut his heart out and takes it and wipes it all over uh, Silkworm's face. And Silkworm is cool with this for whatever reason. And uh, the witch doctor says, hey, now you can control the gorilla. You're welcome. And this whole part was really weird and odd because no one questioned anything about the witch doctor or tried to stop him or was like 
weary about anything. They were just cool with him. They acted like they knew him for five years, not five minutes. Like he's an old buddy. Like, hey, it's Eddie. He's he's here. He's gonna put blood on her face. No, they, everyone was just cool with it. No one was like, there's some creepy old witch doctor doing like voodoo magic stuff. Maybe we should kill him or like send him that way or something instead they're just like nah he's harmless he just brought this old gorilla this giant gorilla back to life that we just cut its heart out let him rub blood on your face no one seemed to care i guess like the jawbreaker's parents never taught him stranger danger or anything like that like they just kind of are all cool with this witch doctor oh and i forgot to mention we saw a hell priest and devil dog who both got stuck inside the giant gorilla eyeball they uh finally escape only to meet the villain of far cry 6 who is an african cowboy cyborg that uh captures them and tells them that zaxi was a uh, working for him the whole time and she hired him i mean he told her to go hire the jawbreakers to capture the gorilla so he can get the treasure that's inside the gorilla and also sell the gorilla's parts like because giant gorilla parts you know fetch a lot of money so that was his evil scheme this is like the true villain of the book and he shows up part way through he looks kind of cool anyways after a little bit hell priest and devil dog escape out of the back of the uh, warlord cyborg dude's van and it's actually a really cool panel the first panel we get because devil dog who i i like his design by the way i think he looks pretty badass is like snapping this dude's neck i don't i'll try to put it up on screen but the problem is i have the physical edition i don't have a digital so sorry for like the lack of scans that i'm able to put on screen because I'm, I'm just gonna have to go off like whatever i can find on google images so uh yeah that that part kind of sucks but anyways um he's like snapping this dude neck this dude's neck and he looks all cool calm and calculated and badass and like this one panel tells me more about the character than like any of the dialogue or like actual story beats did because of like the way Malin drew it it looks sick like you can tell that devil dog's been through a lot and he's been through like all these different circumstances so none of this like bothered all the chaos going on like this van crashing and stuff while he's like breaking this dude's neck doesn't matter to him he's been through it all he's seen it all and it's like a really cool panel it's probably my favorite of the book and it tells me a lot about the character but anyways those two break out of the van and hell priest makes a blind joke and then he's like what i'm allowed to make blind jokes and i was a little confused by this because this is implying that hell priest is blind but if hell priest is blind then what was the whole point of the joke earlier where hell priest couldn't see the eyeball because then if he can't see it it makes sense so is he blind or is he not blind? Is it something with his powers? Because later on he goes like he can see the Jawbreaker's team, but he can't see the gorilla because the gorilla has no soul. So he's blind, but he can see souls, I guess. Does that mean he can walk into a wall? What? Like, again, nothing being explained here. This is where it would have been nice to have like a Power Rangers intro or something. Be like, I'm Hell Priest and I can see souls, but nothing else. Or something like that. Instead, I'm so confused like, why was everyone making fun of him for not being able to see the eyeball earlier if he's blind? I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, this video is getting a little long, so I'm going to try to wrap up the end of the story and then give you guys my final thoughts on the book. So, Zaxi attacks her master and he snaps her neck, then Killswitch shoots the cyborg cowboy with the minigun on his helicopter. The giant ape goes through a portal to try and reunite with his soul. This somehow has a connection with Silkworm. I don't know how, but then we cut to the team back at the base. They're all mourning Zaxi because they all were best friends with her. Then Silkworm walks off on his own. We see him pull out a picture and the book reads, If he can regain his lost soul, then there's hope for all who wonder. No idea what that means, but that seems to be a one of the big themes of the book. Confusion and not letting the reader know what the hell's going on. But that's how the book ends. Um, so final thoughts. The art and the colors are pretty good. Well, the art was pretty good. Colors are fantastic. Dialogue, <laughs> there were some funny moments, but for the most part, dialogue was not very good. Story was all over the place. My main problem with the book was the breakneck speed of just like, go, 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 go. We have limited pages. We have to be in everywhere and just keep going and not explain anything. And I'm not sure what the point of the story was. It was like, the name of the book is Lost Souls, and we see that the gorilla lost his soul. But why, why did going through the portal make the gorilla lose his soul? And why, the gorilla had a soul? I didn't, gorillas have souls? I didn't, like, but Silkworm doesn't have a soul, or he does, or he's trying to recreate, re, 
claim someone else's soul, like his daughter's or something? Is that what that picture meant? I don't, I don't, at the end of the day, I have no clue what the hell the story was. I really want to see what, like, Meyer's uh, story outline was. Was, like, super-powered A-team is in France. They get, we get to see them being buddy-buddy and they're funny and stuff. And then they get a new job in Nigeria. They take down Giant Ape in five seconds. Giant Ape has no soul. They reunite Ape with soul. End. I don't know what the point of this story was. I'm so confused. And not in a good way. It's not like when you read a Grant Morrison book and you're kind of confused. So it makes you want to read it like ten more times to try to like understand it. Here it's like... I don't think reading it anymore will make me understand it any better. It's just, I'm not sure what the story was. My, I think a big problem with this book was, well, number one, there's no editor. I think that's a huge problem because when I went to the um, the credits part of the book, that was one of the things I was looking for because we have like, here's the credits part. And I was like, hold on, written by, line art, coloring, lettering, all this stuff. I'm like, there's no editor? DNC roasts books all the time for like bad editing and stuff, and he doesn't even have an editor. It's like that editor could have helped you with some things and helped a lot. I think uh, he would have just like having some type of mentor or someone to help him would have been good because you hear about that a lot of times with like up and coming writers and stuff, is they have like an industry vet to help them. Meyer did not have that, and it shows um, because the writing is really rough. It's really, 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 really rough. And there's like the art and the colors cannot save it. And I just, I think Meyer had too many ideas. Like he wanted to do a thousand things at once. But the problem was nobody knows who the hell the drawbreakers are except for Meyer. And he doesn't explain it. Maybe in the other stories he does. I haven't read the other two stories in the book yet. Because again, what we were sold on was the first story. And in that case, also, if the other two do explain it, why were they not the first story in the book? Why is it the other one if they do? But again, it's just like, this is the first, this is when you're releasing your characters to the masses, is this book, and you don't explain anything. It's like, oh, well, I did this Kickstarter 10 years ago. Go check out that book. That's the one where it explains the characters. It's like, no, this is the one that more people are getting in on. You should have explained it some in this. It's just... I, I, it can only get better from here on the bright side. I don't see Meyer as someone that's going to like just push off everyone's criticism and be like, nah, I'm right. I don't think so. I think he'll take them to heart. I think he'll get better. I don't know if he'll ever be like a great writer or anything like that. Who, who knows? But it can only get better from here. Um, I know it's like I was really negative in this review, but that's just because I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like I said, I'm going to, tr like I said at the beginning of my review, I'm going to treat it like it's a Marvel or DC book. And I did. I wasn't going to give it any special treatment. I think anyone giving it special treatment is doing a disservice to Meyer because the only way it gets better is through criticism. Just sugarcoating it and be like, yeah, it's not Marvel or DC, so it's great is not the way to go and is wrong. Like, there's nothing wrong with criticizing the book. Even if you think it's a steaming pile of garbage, say it's a steaming pile of garbage. You think it's great? It's great. That's fine. But to lie about your feelings about it, I don't think that's good or conductive at all. But anyways, overall, again, the quality of the book's good. Colorings are is fantastic. The, the colors are fantastic. The art's pretty good, but the writing is very shoddy and needs a lot of work. And yeah, again, I still really like Meyer. I just think his writing's not very good. Um, but yeah, anyways, those are my thoughts on Jawbreakers. If you guys have read Jawbreakers, please let me know in the comments below. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Yeah. On my grind all day, gonna make a million sun that someday. You know I'm in the building when I ride this way. Put me in the prowl when I bite this game, uh.